Well, welcome to another Cutting Edge show. I am uh, one of your hosts. I'm Omar Neal, uh, former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, host of the You Got the Power radio talk show. Uh, 31 years and counting last week. So we are so appreciative to be a part of this cutting edge space. Uh, this program is being brought to you in part by uh, the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Uh, we are so appreciative to have this show because we focus not just on uh, uh, the COVID-19, but for all issues. So we focus on COVID-19 and health issues uh, that impact us all. We got a really, really good show today. We want to talk about uh, uh, how do we level set. Uh, we call this show a ball of confusion, unpacking the what, when, and how of keeping your family safe from COVID-19 and other health threats. Uh, we got a really Power Pack show. We got Dr. Reed Tuxon, who is the managing director of Tuxon Health Connection LLC. We have Dean of the Dean of the University of Maryland School of Public Health, Dean Boris Lusniak. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Michelle Andrasik, who is the director of social and uh, behavioral science and uh, so and community engagement, HIV vaccine trials network and COVID-19 Prevention Network. And we have a, a regular for us, uh, Katrina Randolph, who's the stylist and owner of Trey Shea's uh, studio and certified community health worker. So we got a really power pack uh, show today. We're gonna, we're gonna try to come away today with some understanding of what do we do now to keep us and our family safe. But I, we don't wanna go any further till I bring my co-host on. Uh, he is a brother from another mother. He's a professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Health and director of the Maryland Center for Health, Health Equity. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my co-host, um, Dr. Stephen B. Thomas. We call him Dr. Tia amongst these parts. Hey, my friend, how are you doing? <laughs> hey, Mayor, it's great to be here. And what a moment to level set. I'm so glad to hear you say that. And do we have a panel for that this week? Amazing. I'm going to tell you, I read the newspaper the day, and I read a column by Louina Wynn. She was a major spokesperson as it, when it comes to these issues, former commissioner of health for the city of Baltimore. And her column read like this, I'm not masking my children as they get ready to go back to school. Mm. And then she spoke of it not as a scientist, but as a mother, as a mother and ball of confusion. You want to talk about a ball of confusion? Mm. Uh, all the COVID calculus that moms and dads and families now have to do to determine how do I keep safe? Now, as you've said, we may think we're done with COVID, but COVID ain't done with us. Absolutely. And not. long, long hauler is one of those things we need to make yep. sure we keep on the radar screen as right. we move forward. Right. A lot of people are saying, you know, everybody's not dying from COVID, you know, but th what they don't understand, even if you survive COVID and, and many people have um, the long hauler effect is something that we have not yet really calculated. <clears throat> and uh, the, the reverberation of long haulers uh, from the COVID-19 uh, infection can stay with you uh, for the rest of your life. And we don't know how debilitating it can be uh, until we uh, till we see it from another angle. So we're yeah. gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about that today too as well. Go ahead, Doctor. Just, T, just, just quickly that? think about it. <clears throat> Two plus years ago, we never heard of this. Right now, it's the fourth leading cause of death. That's a very high baseline to accept. I don't think we should accept it. And right. in our shops around the country, they're not accepting it. We're going to hear about that tonight, too. Yeah. Well, we got we got uh, a great uh, team behind the scene as well, Dr. T. You know, one of the things that's so important uh, as we focus on on what we do in front of the camera, we don't really think about what's happening behind the camera. We have uh, uh, our technical director, Meg Jordan. We have Maggie Daly, assistant technical director. We have. Saraya Khan, our social media media 
and communication, I, we call her a guru. And of course, uh, Elijah Pugh Jr., who is our sound designer. Uh, all of these individuals are working behind the scenes to make what you see in front of the scene uh, or on your screen uh, <laughs> a work. So we are so appreciative of them. You know, you can check us out on all of the social media platforms, uh, the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and uh, make sure that you like, share, and follow us uh, on all of those platforms. And we also have a newsletter that we put out each and every week. That newsletter really capsulates what we've done uh, in the previous weeks. Uh, but not only that, but it gives you really substantive information about how you can navigate COVID and other health issues uh, as well. So it's not just relegate to COVID, although we focus on COVID, uh, we also uh, address other issues as well. It is power packed and information packed. So make sure that you uh, subscribe to our newsletters as well. Well, Dr. T, uh, man, you know, we, I can't wait to just get uh, into this show. So if you would please allow me to bring on my a brother from another mother as well, Dr. Reed Tuxen up. Uh, there we go. Uh, Dr. Tuxen, uh, uh, we, we, he, he really has been with us the whole time. That's uh, right. Uh, when we were working with the White House shots at the shop, Dr. Tuxen was very instrumental in that. I had an opportunity uh, to do a thing uh, with the Ad Council, where uh, Dr. Tuxen was very instrumental in getting that together, uh, where we did one of the major campaigns on, on COVID vaccine uptakes and how to uh, dispel the Tuskegee myth. There you go. Uh, uh, and all of that. Dr. Tuxen was right there, man. Dr. Tuxen really has taken uh, the bull by the horn as it relates to truly putting it where the cows can get it. Uh, <laughs> And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a friend of the cutting edge and my friend, Dr. Reed Tuxen. How you doing? Man, Mayor, I'm doing great. Stephen, I'm doing great. I got to catch up to that, the, the, the bulls and the cows. I mean, man, <laughs> I'm, I'm from Washington, D.C., brother. I've got a lot to, to learn. <laughs> well, you know, you, you're from, you, you came down south, so I figured you've been orientated a little bit already about <laughs> cows and horses. We, you can't, can't ride, ride out in the country and don't <laughs> see them. <laughs> hey, let me just say this. He's got public health mud on his boots as the former commissioner of health for the District of Columbia. He's got firsthand knowledge and a scholar and a physician. Hey, Reed, how you doing? Yeah. Okay, man. Cool. Glad to, glad to be with you in the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's um let's let's you know you know you know. Let me tell you something, man. I, let me full disclosure, man. The the people who are closest to me uh, contracted COVID most recently. You know, people are talking about COVID is over. Uh, I contacted COVID. Uh, my wife, my daughter. And, you know, and several other very close friends. My best man at my wedding. I mean, just very close friends contracted COVID. So, so for me, COVID is not over with. Um, and, and I think that people have kind of, you know, said, you know, let's, let's just go back to normal. And I understand why, but there is a risk to doing that. Am I being hyperbolic, uh, Dr. Well, Reed Texan? You're not being hyperbolic at all. And let's just remember one thing, folks, going back to normal is not what we want to be. Normal was killing us. You understand? Oh, wow. Normal yeah, was killing us. So don't ever let anybody tell you to go back to normal. That's like going back into a place where we're being slaughtered. Uh, we need better than normal. But think about this this way, brother, that just last week alone, listen, look at the death counts. One day last week, it was 620. The next day, it was 700 and some. There was another day last week where it was 1,000. So Imagine, even right now, while we're talking about this, up to a thousand people are dying every single day in this country from this disease. This ain't over. And if you want to know again about just, you know, I'll tell you, you talk about your personal journey. In the last three weeks, my brother, who is a colorectal surgeon, got it. I got it. Haven't seen him. But I got it. And then my 96 year old mother just came out of isolation yesterday. So we've all gotten it in the last three weeks. And I will tell you this from the bottom of my heart. 
thank God for these vaccines. Absolutely. Thank God Absolutely. for these boosters. I'm telling you, I miracle. A, ma- a miracle. My Absolutely. mother, 96 years old, and she got through this thing smooth. Smooth. Right. You hear me? Come on now. Yeah, absolutely. I got through it. I'm lucky, man. I got through it smooth. I mean, I was I was tired. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. I, I knew I was sick. Right. It wasn't like I was. <laughs> you know. the, but the worst part of the doggone uh, thing for me, uh, Mayor and Stephen, was I couldn't go out and play with the other boys and girls. <laughs> I know that's a, <laughs> isolation I mean, is something else, man. I'm oh you. boy, the ice cream truck would come by, man, and everybody would go run and get a popsicle, man. I'm stuck in the daggone house, man. Piss me off. So I didn't like that that isolation part. So you don't want that either. But but all seriousness, you set it up properly at the beginning of the show. This disease is now endemic e-n-d-i-m-i-c which is different than pandemic and what endemic means is instead of this being a crisis where it's all of a sudden and everywhere now it is part of life it is part of something we will have to learn to live with like we have learning to live with other things Mm -hmm. and so it now becomes a matter of people using intelligent decision making you know now the rules are very clear about when you should wear your mask, when you shouldn't, if you are exposed, very clear about what you should do, very clear if you test positive, how long you have to stay away. All of it is very formulized and you just need to follow the rules. Why do you need to follow the rules? If you are a black person and you say black lives matter, then they gosh darn it better matter to us first. Mm -hmm. I can't expect black lives to matter as a slogan for somebody else if it doesn't first matter to me. And so we have got to decide how much do we care about Black life? We're spending our time with each other. We spend our time with each other. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So if we're not going to follow the rules, I'm not wearing my mask or I'm I'm through with it. All you're saying out loud is, I don't give a damn about whether or not I sicken and kill another Black person. That's all it said. I simply don't care about you. Wow. Could that be anybody would actually, can you imagine somebody standing up and putting a sign on? Remember when uh, Milana Trump got on an airplane one time and she had a big thing on the back? I don't give a damn. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) You know, she just said it. I don't care. Can you imagine a black person putting that on their back saying, I could care less whether I made you sick and die or not. So wow. that's what I think we're down to, uh, brother, uh, brother mayor. You know, you know uh, Reed, let me just say that the title of the show, the opening, Ball of Confusion. So you're absolutely right. The guidelines are there. The mitigation is there. Uh, the importance of air filtration is there. And yet on the ground, in the neighborhood, in the hood, there's confusion. And that's what we want to clear up tonight because yeah. we have folks watching us around the country. We have members of uh, our wellness warriors in the barbershops and salons, our shots at the shop team are out there listening. We're going to help them make sure that their places of business are trusted information centers so that we can help our community follow these new guidelines. Well, I'll, I'll help to give you some, cl- and I know you have other guests that are going to do yeah. this in, in detail. Yeah. So I won't take their thunder, but let me just say a couple of quick things for people to understand. You have all heard, and 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 and, and Mayor, you started us out thinking about um, looking at COVID in the context of other diseases, that this is just one now of many fights we have coming up. Mm-hmm. We have always had these disparities in health a fancy way of saying that the health of black folk compared to white folk is suboptimal. And we can measure in by diseases, length of of survival, how different we are from white folk. When it comes to COVID and vaccinations, despite all of the challenges that we've had, all the anvils we've had to carry, all the mean spirit purveyors of dis and misinformation targeted to doing us harm, despite the legacy of Tuskegee and the legacy of Henrietta Lacks and the legacy of of police brutality, all of that on our back. And we're still trying to run a race. Do you know for the first time in modern (laughs) history, black folks closed the disparities gap between white people for for, for primary series vaccinations? Come on now. And and you know what? You know who did it? It wasn't the white man. (laughs) 
-hmm. It was the black church, the black fraternities and sororities, black community-based organizations, the, the, the mayor and Stephen Barber and beauticians program. <laughs> it was black folk taking care of black people. And we closed that gap. Wow, there you go. So let me just say to everybody here, we've shown that we can succeed, that this yes. is hopeless, that it isn't just, oh my God, we're all gonna die, there's nothing I can. We have shown when we decide to move, we can get there. Now we gotta close the gap on boosters. There you go. That's the goal, close right. the gap on boosters. And then finally, when you go through the guidelines, because Stephen is, Dr. Thomas is right, that sometimes it can be confusing, but it really is pretty straightforward. You know, I wear my mask any time I am out in public. I always do. Why do I do it? Because until recently, you know, I had never had COVID. I don't know if I'm carrying it any particular day. Right. I may be, I'm in a good spot right now because I'm double boosted and got the immunity from the uh, from disease. So I'm kind of like Superman. When it comes to, but, but for a minute, I'm like, hey, come bring it on. I mean, I'll kick any COVID virus, but today, but what about tomorrow? There you go. The point is, I don't know what I'm carrying or picking up as I'm going through the streets. Why would I give that to somebody if I'm right. in in a non-ventilated environment. So it's straightforward. I wear my mask because I love black people, period. Okay. Right. I wear my mask because I love black people. Now, well, you know, you know, let me say this um, <laughs> because because we because we really going to have uh, uh, this this conversation and it is always so wonderful uh, to have uh, Dr. Reed Tuxen because D Dr. Reed Tuxen, if you didn't know putting it where the cows can get it before, <laughs> that's what you just did. So you, now, <laughs> now you know. If you didn't know, now you know. All uh, right, that's that's putting where the cows can get it. Okay, so now you that's know. The, okay. That's the point I wanted to, to, to make. <laughs> right, you, you, so you made, you the, made the point. The All second right, let, point I'm making, let, let, I'm done. I mean, okay. I'm going to let y'all get your guests because I, I really respect, you know, uh, Dr. Lashonik and, and, and Michael and son. I mean, you got some really good people, Katrina. Uh, but let me just say, after you decide that you're going to wear your mask when you're indoors with people uh, that you don't know and that you don't live with because you care about them, then the second thing you're going to do is if somebody says, okay, I'm, if a person starts, to, if you don't feel well and you're starting to get a little sick, and you say, whoa, wait a minute, this is not good. I'm feeling something different than I normally feel. Then you go ahead and get one of those over-the-counter tests. You buy your test and you test yourself. It's very straightforward. Test comes yeah. back positive. You know exactly what to do. Right. That's positive. You know how long you got to isolate. You know what it is. No ice cream truck. You know that's exactly <laughs> this. You just you just out of ice cream. That's there you a, go. That's, that's you got you right. got two weeks of no ice cream. That's all. <laughs> that's all <it> is. <laughs> and then if, and if somebody and then if somebody calls you and says, I tested positive. And by the way, if you test positive, you make doggone sure you call everybody you've been around. Hey, listen. You've been exposed. Right. I don't know if you got it, but you've been exposed. That right. person then said, I got to put on my mask because right. I've been exposed. I could be carrying this around to somebody. Right. Put your mask. And then eventually after uh, five or so days, you test yourself. That's right. You, you are not tested. If you're positive, if you're not positive, take off your mask. Enjoy yeah. your life. There you so go. In the room with other people again. So it's very simple. So I will leave that to the, uh, the rest of the team. <laughs> But thank you all. And I would say to our beauticians and barbers, you and you, I know you know, but let's just say that other people outside of your world know the role you play in our community, in our society. You have more clout and authority than almost any other sector in our society. Think about it. Think about this. One TikTok influencer who never graduated high school can do more damage <laughs> than all the good that the Black Coalition Against COVID can do, which is comprised of the CEOs of all four medical schools, Black medical schools, the National Medical Association, the National Black Nurse, all of us together trying to put out messages to save you. One influence on TikTok can go, well, my brother in Trinidad had uh, his uh, testicles got swolled up from a vaccine, you know, and all of a sudden everything goes crazy. And right. this, you know, we got to spend three days stomping out nonsense. You right. as barbers and beauticians 
can be in the room or in the place where craziness is. That's speaking. right. And people take crazy and harm other people. You can say, excuse me, brothers, that ain't true. Sister, right, right. that ain't true. Come on now, let's get real. Be the play. You have more power than you possibly know. And the rest of us who are out here observing your work appreciate the role you're playing. Thank you for what you do for our people. Absolutely. Thank let's you. give them some snaps. Come on. Let's, let's, this let's, is how let's we do it, Reed. Come on, that, snap them. That, 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 that's that's what we... <laughs> You know, and 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 that's you know. Well, I'm a drummer, need to, so I got to make mine. Really you know, you, <laughs> you know, you know. But people need to hear that. They that's really right. need to hear that uh, because they are uh, trusted information centers, and so it's not just the message; it's also the messenger. There you go. Right, and so we have trusted messengers. Let's let's go to the dean of the uh, School of Public Health at University of Maryland, Dr. Boris Nusniak. Uh, uh, you know, I met this person. Uh, that I, I I really like uh, Dean Lusniak, uh just in in a lot of ways. But I'm but glad he, to hear that. I'm glad he, to hear that, Mayor. You you, you know you, you always <laughs> talking about I was on the team when he was selected. You know you I don't know why you keep saying that. <laughs> you but, just but, happens uh, to be my boss. You know yeah, <laughs> but you know you always say you know I was you might be my boss, but I was on the team the, the selection yeah, team. There you go. You know when you do, so you you be you you remind him of that. You release you remind me of that. <laughs> but anyway, this 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 brother was actually the acting the sur uh, uh, surgeon general. You know, I mean, we talked about what uh, uh, Dr. Tuxin was. It's, he was an acting surgeon general. He's been at the highest level of public health uh, in 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 all spaces, and and he's with us today. He's a really a supporter of of what we are doing uh, in the, the many iterations of. Of, of of this work uh all the way from shots at the shop and 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 to to the cutting edge ladies and gentlemen please join me <laughs> in welcoming our friend the the dean of the school of public health for the university of maryland dean boris d lusniak hey man how go. you doing hey it's great to be back my friend it's great to be back <laughs> now, Here we go. Go. <laughs> now you that you see man that 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 that's that's understanding what's, what's going on absolutely you know you know dean you know we we you know i've always i always ask you to tell me uh you know why do people who are in leadership position do not understand that messaging is so important. You can know it yourself. That, that there is a saying that a thinking human being unable to express him or herself stands at the same level as someone who cannot think, right? How is it, why is it that there is so much mismessaging? And I'm not going to say what where it's coming out of, but you are at the ham. Of, of of public health, right? And 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 the messaging to the general public has been uh, ambiguous at best. Okay. Is, is is that fair to say to start out with you? It's very fair to say that. And first of all, thank you for having me back. It's always great being on the show. And what a pleasure it is to, to be here with Dr. Tuxton. Uh, always big fan. Uh, of your career path. And boy, the wisdom he already shared with us. It's like, I can, you know, he should just drop the mic and leave and, and, and leave at this point. And, and I'll just say, I'll, whatever Dr. Tuxton says is the right thing. Ditto. So, huh? getting, getting back to your, your question, Mayor, you know, part of the issue here is, you know, I've been a public health practitioner all of my adult life, right? As a physician trained in, in family medicine, then in occupational preventive medicine, then in dermatology. I'm not saying that to, to, to praise myself. It's just that with a long career in, in the yeah. medical sciences and then a long career in, in public health practice, CDC, FDA, and the Office of the Surgeon General, what I noted throughout that whole career path, and especially the five years I spent as Deputy U.S. Surgeon General and a year and a half as the Acting U.S. Surgeon General, is the interplay of what? The interplay of what we call politics mm -hmm. into public health. Now, there's no denying that when we're dealing with public health, we're dealing with the public, it does get political. A friend of mine reminded me of a definition that I used to always throw out, even as the, in the Surgeon General's office. What's the definition of politics? Poly from the Greek meaning many, and ticks, blood-sucking insects. 
<laughs> the cows right. can get that too. And, 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 and the yeah, problem that's of putting course, it where the cows can get it too. <laughs> exactly. So now we, yeah, now we interplay with the cows, right? No, but you know, all, all sort of humor aside here, the problem, of course, is when we get into sort of the political scenario, and, and even the medical scientists who are on the political side of the house, and I used to be one of them have to always kind of spin it, have to always kind of think of, well, how is it going to affect and then put in the dot, 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 right. affect the political appointees, affect those who were elected, elect the you know, And the reality is at the end of the day, our people, right? Our people are smarter than that, mm -hmm. right? So the whole idea of spin only makes us, the public health people who start spinning things look silly. Because ultimately, even though, as, as Dr. T had mentioned and you had mentioned, it gets confusing, the reality is that the messages are out there. And what we lack is the ability to do the basic skills of communication, right? I was trained to basically communicate on the public health realm. Tell people what you know. Tell mm -hmm. them what you know. Be right. honest. Be right. truthful. No spin. Right. At the same time, tell them what you don't know. Be honest right. in terms of vulnerability. Be honest the fact that, that medical science isn't, you know, ha doesn't have all the answers at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. But then also tell them how we're going to find out about the stuff we don't know. And then have people understand what we are recommending. Very clear and to the point. And where we've ended up, Mayor, is, is it, a sense is that too many people were speaking from too many sides. And the reality is we are now two and a half years into this. And frankly, the population is tired. We are all tired. But just because you're tired doesn't mean that the race is over, right? <laughs> right. It doesn't mean right. that the race is over. And I think that's a key feature here. Dr. Tuxen mentioned, you know, I mean, the statistics are still out there, yet nobody's really talking about them. Right. I'm looking at the Johns Hopkins site right now, 150,000 new cases in the last 24 hours in the United States. Now, mind you, 150,000 cases, that's undoubtedly right on the low side. That's an estimate because guess what? Nobody's reporting that they're positive anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. In the right. last 24 hours, as he mentioned in the last week, 933 people died from COVID. Now, that's much more accurate, I would say, because people usually die in hospital settings and they have death certificates. You don't estimate that. You actually have those numbers. And somehow we're behaving as if, again, that the race is over, as if we've won. We haven't won. We're in mid-stride and things can change drastically. You know, uh, Dean, as the mayor uh, uh, shared our folk behind the scenes, you were looking at your grads from our School of Public Health. And so this is like not only a marathon, but, but, but a relay. We're going to have pass this baton to that next generation. Just a little thumbnail of what might we be doing differently for the students coming through now who have said in public, oh, now my parents know what I do. Now they know what public health is. All this time, they didn't know what public health was. What do we do to make sure that that is not the case moving forward with this next generation. Well, I think it's critical that we talk and we teach facts right now. So yesterday I had the honor of actually welcoming in our newest class of graduate students. Uh, by the way, Omar, now that, that Dr. T always takes the, uh, the credit for hiring me since he was on the committee, <laughs> his wife, Sam, Dr. Sandra Quinn, can take credit because she was on the review committee that actually now uh, gave me my second term as dean, which I accepted last week. So I'm still. Well, in the, let's give let's give another, another five, five years. years. Yeah. So right. it's all about it's all about uh, Dr. T and Dr. Q. Dr. That, that, that's what they call the hookup, Dr. Exactly, Dr. exactly. Yeah. So anyhow, so they're 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 in control. Right? Right I, am, right I, in. I am I am bottom marionette, and they control the strings. <laughs> uh, but but that being said, I think you know the way I welcomed them yesterday was fact. You are here for a reason. And, you know, when I speak, I don't speak at a podium. I'm walking around the room, looking at them, you know, directly into their eyes. And at some point I said to them, you had a choice. You had a choice coming into this public health profession. You could have run away in the opposite direction. I actually, in our lecture hall, ran out the door. Right? And, and they were a dog in a gas because the dean was no longer in front of them. Then I walked back in and I said, 
But on the contrary, you chose to walk in here and stay. Point number one, it's that whole idea of passion. How do you make sure that people understand what they're getting into? But just as importantly, and this is the obligation on you, Dr. T, as a teacher, Dr. Tuxen as a teacher, Omar as a teacher, Mm -hmm. our our, our barbers and, and stylists and hairdressers as teachers, is that we have to teach them what worked this past two and a half years and what didn't work. And we have to be honest about our failures because unless we're honest about our failures, there's no improvement. And I think that's a critical piece of where this next generation of public health leaders need to be led. All right. Wow. That's powerful. Let, let's, let's bring on uh, uh, <laughs> Katrina Randolph. Uh, we, you know, we, this is a person who's been with us from uh, day one. Uh, Katrina Randolph is a stylist and owner of uh, Trey Shea's studio, and uh, she's a certified community health worker. Uh, but not only that, uh, Dr. T says she's she's the short hair queen, which means that it, it, Dr. T is the only one can make that statement. They say she she does. She's 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 like a magician uh, with with short hair. She she can really just make it uh, pop. Right. So so ladies and gentlemen, this is a person who's really been there with us the entire time. She is a family member of the Cutting Edge Show. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our very own Katrina Randolph. How you doing? All right, Katrina. <laughs> hey, Katrina. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, you, you, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I say hello, oh. everyone. It is a pleasure to be a part of this Zoom tonight. Absolutely. Um, I'm doing very well. Um, Some of the things that you all addressed tonight, we're still implementing in our salon and we will continue to implement that as far as all safety protocols are concerned. Every week, my staff um, has a mandate mandate to take a COVID test in order to work in the salon alongside of me. Um, Our clients have to um, follow all of our safety protocols. You have to wear a mask. You have to come in and sanitize your hands. You have to continue to keep that mask on until you exit. And so does our staff because we want to make sure that everybody remains safe. So we treat our salon like a safe place, a health hub for good information when you come into our space to let, keep you updated on what's going on with COVID and <laughs> monkeypox and all those good things. And being a part of this network, I always tell Dr. T, I am forever grateful because it has truly increased our revenue being this safe space. People are calling daily. Our phones are ringing off the hook. We can't even service all of them. And the first thing that they asked us are you that um, are you a COVID safe salon? Absolutely. So people are definitely looking for that. It definitely sets us apart. Um, I tell Dr. T all the time, this vision that he came up with for these wellness warriors and our hair network is an awesome network. It was something that was definitely needed in our community. And I'm forever grateful to be on this platform with all of you amazing doctors, Dr. (laughs) Tuxton. You always share great information with us that we can definitely take back and share behind our chair. And as he said, we're the cows and get it at the simplest form because we are not the medical professionals, but we do share health information. So thank you for allowing me, me to be a part. You, you, know, you, know, uh, you know, Katrina's Katrina, a poet and don't know it. She <laughs> says, share behind our chair. You know, now, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if y'all didn't, yeah, you, you didn't catch that, right? I caught it. We going to share behind the chair, right? So, I mean, hey, hey, that, 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 that was tough. I like that. that that's hey, I, hope, I hope, I hope the folk uh, uh, wrote that down. So, cause we going to use that again, that, that larceny just took place. Uh, uh, <laughs> Katrina Randolph, I just stole that. So if it so could save what, lives, if it could save no, lives. Read, read, read what to say something. Go ahead. I just real, real fast, but uh, um, because you, you again talked about how we're going to have to live with COVID and still then connect with other health challenges, and I and you talked about Katrina's haircut, hairstyle. One of the things that I tried to lead years ago through the Bonner Brothers uh, 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 annual convention in Atlanta uh, for years tried to create a competition for exercise friendly hairstyles so that Mm -hmm. women would not be able to have their hair cause them not to want to work out. And by the time we finished it, uh, Mayor, um, we were the second largest attended session and the second largest prize money at the Bonner Brothers. And we had WNBA stars, all kinds of people who were showing 
stylist, how do you get your customers? To, and, and, and so I'm on a, the way I'll close it is I'm on a crusade for black men to make sure that every time they see a black woman with exercise friendly hair, that they say, hey, sister, you're looking great. <laughs> So we, I'm trying, so I want to ask everybody to let's try to create a demand for hairstyles where women can work out and be healthy and not have to, because one sister in, at the shop that I was in, she basically was saying, hey, she had it so heavy to do. And she said, I'm, ho I'm, I'm a holy roller. I ain't even getting up and sweating in church Sunday. <laughs> You, well, you know, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because I, I have one of those ha hairstyles. <laughs> this, is, this is what you call a, an exercise friendly hairstyle I have. I'm telling you, you know, I don't have to worry about it. Don't blow in the wind. It just is. It just be there. So that's that's good. You, 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 know, you, you always bring something, something to the table. That's that's wonderful. Go ahead, Dr. T. What were you saying? Well, we all remember some of us are old enough to remember when there was a Surgeon General who found herself in that controversy politics as the as as the dean was describing uh making the case that black women were not being physically active because of their hairstyles now at the same time i want the dean to know and anyone else listening out there laws have had to be passed against discriminating against hairstyles mm. and some of these exercise friendly hairstyles would be the source of, oh, you can't come into the bank looking that way. Laws have been passed called the Crown Act. That lets you know how deep this is. But I wanted to just ask Katrina real quick before our next guest comes up. If somebody comes into your shop, Katrina, and they want to mitigate, but they don't have an N95 mask, they don't know where to get a, a rapid test, what can you do for them in your shop? We offer everything for safety protocol. If you need a KN95 K mask, we have those. If you need Whoa. some hand sanitizer to take with you, we have that to give to you. If you need a COVID test, if you're going on vacation or you just want to take a COVID test, you can come into Trey Shades. We have all of that to let you know that we are that safe space. You can call us at any time if you need a COVID test or a mask, and you're definitely leaving with one if you didn't enter here with one. You can't even enter our salon without a mask on. I right. like that. Service in our space without a mask at all. And those clients who don't understand that, we're willing to turn them away. Wow. And you know, if we're gonna have people and have restrictions, I think we also have to have the solution, be it in a classroom, on a campus, or in a barbershop or salon that those resources are available if people don't have them. Thank you. you. Know, I want to talk a little bit about the intersectionality of, you know, the, the legal authority or the politics and public health. And what I'm talking about is public health can mandate certain things. It, it has certain powers to do that. And I want to talk with <laughs> Dean about that. Dean, you know, being the mayor, you all can come in and say, Mayor, you all need to impose this. Uh, and, and, and we have to acquiesce to that because uh, there are certain powers that are given the public health people. And so I want to talk a little bit about that in this hyperpartisan space. How, does, how, does, how do you navigate through that being a public health professional? Well, you know, it's always interesting, Mayor. That's a great question. And, you know, when we look at other examples of where public health had to intervene, there's both successes and failures in that, right? We always describe this, and very bluntly, sometimes it's the carrot, sometimes it's the stick approach, right? To basically saying, here's what's good for you. Now, you know, people always view this as if it's, you know, a, a paternalistic, maternalistic parental duty in public health, and people get offended by that. I actually don't get offended by it because what do we have in terms of sort of a parental approach, right? Uh, people derogatorily call it the nanny state. Oh, somebody cares about you? Is that a bad thing? Somebody says that in essence, I'm doing this for, you know, these recommendations for your health, for your well being. I, I always describe to our students of, of public health being a profession of love, right? It is of giving to others, to a society, to, to the community. And yet oftentimes the whole idea is where did things work in terms of, of regulation, in terms of legislation? Well, you know, seatbelts in cars is a public health intervention, 
right? And somehow years ago, when it was first proposed that you put a seatbelt in the car to save lives, a lot of people resisted, right? There was a sense of the industry saying, oh, you're going to put these additional costs on us and, and people won't be able to afford cars. Mm-hmm. Others said, well, people will never take this up, right? You, you know, and the reality is we changed the society ultimately where the majority of people now think of it as part of the features of a car, safety features. We see, see the same thing in terms of sort of regulations dealing with, with uh, smoking tobacco products, right? And mm-hmm. just the whole idea, you know, let's remember that the first Surgeon General's report on smoking and health came out in 1964. And at that point, 42%, 42% of American adults were smokers. And what we have is 55, 56, 57 years later now, going on 58 years later now, what do we have? We have an acceptance that, you know, not everybody is, is, is still on board with this, but we really have made a major change. So we're in, in you know, in the teens in terms of percentage of people who smoke on a daily basis because of interventions. And these interventions include all the rules and regulations regarding cigarette smoking. Where can you smoke? Where can you not smoke, et cetera, et cetera. The issue that I think we're approaching with with COVID is all of a sudden we're in more confusion than ever before, right? I mean, the the fact that the courts kind of came out and said, "Oh, oh, this airplane rule, right? Of people having to wear masks on airplanes, hey, not so much anymore, right? Ah, you know, maybe it's an infringement, maybe it's... So I think we're, we're kind of in a dangerous time where you know, uh, in the old days, you can say this is good for the public's health. This is good for the population's health and actually have data. And then politicians, and I didn't mean to be derogatory about politics, Mayor, because I knew that at one point you were a politician. Hold up, Dean. I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> exactly. you just, you did. <laughs> but that being said, I, I think okay, we're, 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 we're going into dangerous times where now public health is actually afraid to speak speak out and actually, you know, give the recommendations to the policymakers. Uh, because now everybody has been questioning public health and it has been questioning the policymakers. So we're kind of in the wild west of, well, you know, at the end of all this, maybe just do whatever you want to do. That ain't the answer, folks. Right. right? That, that's not going to work. And so we have to have the senses, believe in public health, right? We've screwed up a whole lot over the years. You know, we've screwed up a whole lot. But at the end of this, it is still right heading us in the right direction. It's about the protection of the population. You know, I think you said something, Dean. There are a lot of people who do not have not ever connected or correlated things like seatbelts and and smoking and all of that to public health. I mean, you know, I mean, so you have really uh, illuminated and enlightened a lot of people. Just based on your going through that that litany, uh, uh, Dean Tuxen, you wanted to uh, uh, chime in on that. Yeah, I'll just be uh, very brief, but I think that uh, Dr. Lushniak makes a very important point, and I think it's even worse than than he has even described it. What you will see going forward, and 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 Dr. T mentioned again how easy it is to be confused if you don't know who to listen to. You will see all of the Trumpites who are in office in all the states that are the red states you will see them very aggressively attack any guidance uh, that you have been hearing from public health. They, you know, you're seeing it in Florida with, the, with Governor DeSantis and his health commissioner, who happens to be a man of color, uh, who has come out and said, you know, I don't believe in masks. I don't believe in vaccination for children, all kind of craziness. You're going to see public health leaders attacked if they even begin to come up and say, Here are the things we need to do to save lives. And so what I would just say to you is, please, please do not be confused by those people who who are the descendants and the progeny of those who have always tried to run us over, keep us subjected and keeping us ill. Do not be confused by what you will see going on. Listen to the people you trust. Who can you trust? You can trust Uh, Black health professionals, you can trust the Black medical schools, you can trust NMA, you can trust Black nurses. Listen to these people, but just know there is a absolute calculated effort uh, on the part of politicians who do not ever want to let economy suffer 
because of a disease. If you have to let people die and you know that black people are dying disproportionately, mm -hmm. they okay with that. Go ahead and die. But the one thing you ain't getting in the way of is anything that has to do with money. This is right. cold blooded. So it comes back to Black Lives Matter. Wow. Let's let's uh, bring up our, our next guest. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Robert. Oh, man, I have exactly. to go to something else. So thank you. Well, well, but thank you, man, so much. Let's let's give uh, uh, Doctor <laughs> Reed Tuxton some snaps, man, and and and, and some love, brother. You know thank we love man. you here. So you are, go, you you I'm have an gonna, open invitation. You know that uh, to I'm hang out with us, man. I'm gonna yes. look for the pals. Bye. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's bring up uh, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Michelle. Uh, Andresik, uh, uh, she is um, uh, the Director of Social and Behavioral Sciences uh, and Community Engagement HIV Vaccine Trial Network and uh, COVID-19 Prevention Network. Uh, she works uh, to address uh, social, uh, psychosocial and structural factors associated with HIV risk and STI disparities among marginalized communities in the USA. Let let me let let's bring her on. I mean, to to have that kind of background, <laughs> uh, to have this conversation with her is absolutely wonderful. Uh, hey, Doctor uh, 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 Michelle Andresic, how how you doing? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me here. How are you doing? Good, good, good. You know, we have been having a ball uh, uh, in this conversation space. You know, we, we, we've talked about it from the vantage point that there are many people who are confused as to what to do from this point. We've been living with COVID uh, for the last uh, two and a half years, primarily close to three years. And there are people who have gotten, uh, you know, weary and well doing <laughs> you know they 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 wore the mask and they they did they got vaccinated and they got boosted and then you still want me to wear the mask and so i'm i'm uh, you know i don't know what to do so it is a ball of confusion so now what we're trying to do is just unpack it where do we how do we save our lives and and our family lives from this point so i want to kind of get your take on it from your angle yeah, well, I think probably the most challenging thing about COVID is that it is a new pathogen. And, you know, we're learning about it as well as scientists who are on the field, on the front line, and things are changing uh, for us uh, all the time as well with uh, new mutations of the virus. I mean, viruses mutate and the COVID virus is especially adept at mutating. And, you know, with each one of these mutations, you know, they spin off other mutations. So, you know, and, and for science and for, I think, those of us who are in it, it's sort of exciting to, to try to figure out, you know, what's going on. But at the same time, I recognize how that can be really frustrating for people who just want to know what is going on and you know you don't necessarily know but what we do know to be true and I think that this is where what Dr. Tuxin said is critical you know that you know researchers and scientists as soon as we have the information we're putting it out there for, for our communities for other communities and so what we know to be true now is that the vaccines are really, really super effective at keeping us out of the hospital and keeping us alive. And the boosters are incredibly effective. And even for people who have had the uh, COVID, uh, something we call a natural infection, they have what is called natural immunity. And what we know to be true is that even if you have had COVID, the vaccine gives you an extra added protection, particularly for people who are at increased risk for negative COVID outcomes. So people who have pre-existing conditions, uh, like pre-existing rep respiratory conditions, pre-existing heart conditions, um, diabetes for people who um, are on the obese spectrum and for people who are over the age of 65, you know, because whether or not we want to admit it or not, as we get older, our immune system gets weaker and the, the vaccine and the boosts create 
um, that extra added layer of protection. You know, and it's looking more and more like COVID is going to be sort of like the flu, where we're going to have to get um, boosters every year. And I think that's one thing that people don't recognize with, you know, these the flu, the, the shots that we get every year for the flu is because there, the flu is really, really good at mutating as well. And we don't know which mutation is going to be the dominant mutation that year. So in effect, every year we're kind of getting our flu booster. And COVID is another one of these um, viruses that is going to mutate. And it's looking more and more likely that, you know, this fall, we're probably going to have to get another booster to ensure that it is having the best impact on the virus that is circulating at that time. So a lot of people keep saying, you know, why do we have to keep getting these boosters? And the answer is because it's not the same virus. It continues to mutate. It continues to, um, and, you know, we've been very lucky, you know, with these mRNA vaccines because they've been like super effective against all of these variants. You know, so really we've just been boosting with more of the same, which is really, um, you know, incredibly fortunate for us as humans that we're able to do that um, because it's kept more of us alive and, you know, more of us out of the hospital. So, you know, I, I think, you know, bottom line is that I the science, this is new and, you know, the science is exciting, but it's also incredibly frustrating because we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Um, and we're constantly learning. Uh, so, you know, for, like I said, for a lot of us, that's super exciting. But for many of us, it's really frustrating. <laughs> we're part, you know, part, you know, part, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that, uh, number one, Dr. Andresic, thank you for being on tonight. She also did one of the modules, the original modules for the rapid response training for barbers and stylists. So, so Katrina has gone through your training. She's now a certified community health worker. You see how she's transformed her shop. And we're yeah. trying to do that across the country. But what you just described, and I'm just wondering, um, while it's like the flu in terms of the boosters, it's not, the flu doesn't give you brain fog or type two diabetes. And so I'm wondering this whole notion of, you actually, as long as this virus is circulating in humans and infecting humans, it's going to spin off those variants. And we've just been lucky so far yeah. that there hasn't been a variant to overtake our vaccines. What do we need to do to still get, there's some people who haven't had their first series. There's kids eligible who haven't been vaccinated. What are you seeing at that level as to why we have these miracle vaccines and we do not have the uptake you would expect from the very country that developed them. Yeah, that, well, that's a $50,000 yeah. question. Go ahead. Yeah. Talk to T. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you can ask the same question why we have cases of polio in this country. Okay. Um, you know, after years and years of polio eradication and what we've seen is a trend towards vaccine hesitancy for um, you know, over a decade now. And that trend in vaccine hesitancy is basically um, you know, leading to people not being vaccinated. So we have seen the resurgence of measles outbreaks. We've seen the resurgence of polio. And you know, part of the issue is, and I think that this is the same with COVID, is that most people who know people who've had COVID like have seen the mild to moderate cases, you know, not too many people that I've spoken to have seen people who have long-term COVID who have the brain fog, who haven't been able to return to work. Um, and a lot of what I've seen is that the people who do have this long-term COVID like isolate themselves. So people aren't seeing them, you know, because, um, of the long-term effects that they've had. So it's sort of like a double-edged sword. Like people wow. aren't seeing the really negative impacts of COVID because the people who have negative COVID, that have ne negative COVID impacts are withdrawing and isolating. So, um, you know, what you don't see, you know, is, is not present in 
the when you factor sort of and you weigh your own risks because you're like, oh, you know, I had a friend who had COVID and they were sick for three days and and now they're better again. And chances are, you know, that if you do get COVID, that is going to be your course. Now, if you're unvaccinated, it could be, you know, a lot longer than three days and you could be hospitalized and you could potentially um, die even. But, you know, the, those cases also, because the vast majority of Americans are vaccinated. So what we're seeing is lower hospitalizations. But then again, that's not in our, that's not, you know, in our little bubble. What we see in our bubble is, oh, look, you know, there are all these cases, but, you know, hospitalizations are, are low still. And I know someone who's had COVID and they're doing fine and they were just sick for a little bit. So, uh, you know, if it's not in your, in your face, I think that really is, you know, one of the problems with COVID. And I mean, we could even look at the flu for that. 60,000 people on average die from the flu every year. But how many people actually know someone who's died from the flu? You know, I mean, and when you talk to people, they're like, oh, I don't know anyone who's died from the flu. And, and I think we're seeing the same thing with COVID. And because there's wow. all this vaccine hesitancy yeah. uh, and, and that's a, that is a really, really dangerous mix. The mix of vaccine hesitancy and the mix of people not really being exposed to the severe cases. Well, see, the um, other thing is too. Let me ask this because I want to. I want to create a, a conversation with this, uh, sure. Dr. Andrzejczyk. The the point of the matter is we don't know about long COVID. There are people who are probably experiencing long COVID, but they've not yet are, are correlated it or associated yeah. it with them contracting COVID. There are people who probably had COVID who didn't know they had COVID because they were quasi asymptomatic, right? But but they are still having brain fog and they say, well, that, you know, I'm, I just don't remember like I used to, well, that may be I'm getting older or, mm -hmm. or they just attribute it to, to something else. But they don't know that that could very well be a direct result of their contracting COVID. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, because people aren't testing. You know, we don't have widespread testing. I mean, the cases of COVID are probably way more than, um, you know, we're seeing on, you know, the epi reports because of the lack of testing. And so, you know, people may feel tired, they may feel lethargic, they may feel kind of out of it, and not be attributing that to COVID because their COVID symptomology was um, pretty mild the first time around. And what we're seeing is that, you know, some people who have long-term COVID did have an initial mild course of COVID symptomology. And then, you know, they're having um, fatigue, malaise, uh, brain fog later on. So people may be experiencing that and may not be attributing it to, to COVID. I think that that is very likely, but we don't have the data to confirm or deny that, but that would be that would be my hypothesis that that is indeed happening. Let, let me do this. Uh, we have one of our barbers out of uh, the ATL Atlanta. Uh, and we, uh, we have Katrina's hand up as well. OK, and, and Katrina, Katrina, uh, we're going to let you you uh, since you're on the panel and then we'll go to Andre. Uh, of, uh, in it in the ATL. OK, uh, I just ahead. had a question for Michelle. Um, one of my clients that patronized my salon, her daughter was misdiagnosed before they realized that she had COVID and she's 10 years old. So she sent me a question on, she said when they diagnosed her daughter, um, her daughter had pox, which is an inflammation of the heart. So she was saying that now she's taking her daughter to a therapist. Her daughter is also sent a post, going to a post COVID clinic. And her question was, I thought that you could probably answer this question for me. Her question was, um, how can you prepare a minor child when they feel an anxiety attack coming on and be able to control their emotions and the range that comes with it? Because now she said her daughter are experiencing all kinds of emotional behaviors, depression and stress and isolation. And she don't want to go to school because she's afraid that she may catch COVID again. So I thought that would be a great question that you could kind of expand on for me. 
Yeah, that is a great question. And and by the way, thank you for all the work that you're doing. I really you're appreciate welcome. it. Very appreciative. Uh, you know, uh, there is, there are rampant cases of anxiety and depression among our youth um, post COVID, and I think that the best thing to do is to get them help. Um, there are many interventions that can teach kids how to um, uh, identify anxiety, how to cope with anxiety, um, you know, and there's a range of different skills that people can, um, can learn. Um, you know, full disclosure, um, my child had anxiety um, as a result of COVID. And um, we got her into um, counseling uh, and the person was able to talk to her about the anxiety, uh, you know, talk to her about what to expect when um, anxiety hits, how to um, work through a panic attack and build skills around um, managing anxiety and coping, really being able to cope with the anxiety when it comes up and, you know, what to do when people show up in class and they're not wearing masks and they're sitting next to you, like how to, how to use positive self-talk and, um, you know, talking about the importance of exposure therapy and, and all of that. So, you know, I, I am a huge proponent of getting children the help that they need. And I know, um, you know, that there are therapists around the country who specialize and, and many people of color therapists as well who specialize in treating anxiety and depression in our children. So I would say, you know, look for a therapist and if she needs to find a therapist locally, she can go to the American Psychological Association. They have a therapist mm -hmm. tracker and also um, uh, you can put in, uh, if you uh, have a preference for a race of therapists or that you'd like to have a therapist of color, you can mm -hmm. specify that and um, try to be matched up with someone um, who is a person of color. Okay, okay thank great. You. Thank you. Because she said her daughter has a therapist, but she doesn't feel like the therapist is working for her daughter because she hasn't seen any improvement. So I'll just share the information with her. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Make sure they have expertise in anxiety and exposure therapy and things like that. Not all therapists have expertise in anxiety. I'll yeah. make sure I share the information. Thank you. You're right. welcome. Thanks, uh, Dr. Andre. Uh, let's go. Hey, uh, Andre Russell, uh, he had a question. Uh, uh, Andre, how you doing, man? What's going on down in the ATL? You're muted, Andre. You guys cut me off, so how are you doing, sir? Doing okay. good. <laughs> Your question. Uh, I, I just wanted to um, say a couple of things. One, um, uh, I've been experiencing a uh, Emory class about CRM. If you don't know about it, then I'm not going to expand on it. But when people come in and start talking about the problems that they're having, we've had several uh, of these, uh, uh, I can't say classes, but several of these exposures, uh, and we should take something away. Uh, when I'm talking to uh, Dr. Lushenak, I'm wondering how much stuff can we take away uh, as just uh, barbers and salon uh, people, what can we take away from this and not assume too much responsibility? Uh, and that's kind of where I am right now. That's a good Yeah, good Andre, question. that's a great question. I mean, it's not so much that I'm advocating sort of, you know, at the salons and, and, and the barbershops to take away, you know, the takeaway really needs to be, you know, you as educators, right? I think where, you know, where Katrina and Andre and others have really shined, right, in, in the midst of this crisis is you've become de facto, right, community health workers. Okay. And, and I think that's a key feature, which is, you know, be inquisitive like you are, right? You know, uh, you ask the questions, make sure that you get the right answers. But once you're satisfied, you have an incredible influence on others. You have the ability to, 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 to talk about masking, right, the importance of that. You have the ability to talk about vaccination and the booster shots. 
you know, uh, you have uh, almost an obligation. Uh, I always say that historically, you know, it's interesting when you look at the interplay of medicine and, and the world, world of, of barbers, right? Historically, barbers were the initial doctors of the world, right? You know, there had been that interplay. Uh, and so uh, I, I would say take that obligation freely and, 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 and boldly uh, in the midst of all this. All right. Okay. Well, got, I mean, got, as, as as we're doing as we're doing this, and uh, I don't want to cut you off. I'm sorry, but no, uh, no, as, go ahead. Yeah, as as we're doing this, uh, it hasn't it hasn't presented itself as a problem up to this point. But as far as Dr. Andrzejczak was saying, uh, these things are going to continue to present themselves, like you're saying. And we, as barbers and, and salon people, uh, people are going to come to us, not this time, maybe not next time, but they're going to come back and say, you know, you told me this was going to happen, or you told me that this was a solution to a problem that I'm having. And I'm not going to expand on that too much. I just want to like give that part. Yeah. Well, well I think... I think um... Well, that we wouldn't be you. That would be Dr. Hold, hold up. Let me say this. Yeah. Uh, I think that when we're talking about this, we have to let people know that we don't know everything that's going to happen. And I of think course. that's yeah. part of the that's issue right. is that people, you are not going to be a public health professional. You are a salon or, or stylist or barber. That's what you are. Now you get more information about it and you disseminate information. So you be a conduit by which information is disseminated, but mm -hmm. people are not trying to make you uh, a, a, a public health professional in terms mm -hmm. of, of, of knowing everything about it. And the other yeah. thing is that, and I think it's important that, that and, and that's even for me as a host, uh, my, my thing, I, I'm not a public health professional, I'm hosting a show that deals and address the issue of public health, but I'm not a professional. That's why we bring other people on uh, to talk about that. So don't take mm -hmm. that on yourself. Direct people to information, uh, uh, which is which is what I think the best role for a, a barber and a stylist. Get information you can can you you get, and then direct people to information. I think that's the best way. You to do realize it. I'm just a devil's advocate. You do now, well, well, I understand that. That's fine. <laughs> you, you know, Mayor. You know, yeah. Mayor. As one of the things, as I was listening to both Andre's question, uh, the dean's response, and Dr. Andresic, and that's making sure that our barbers and stylists have a referral network. That when they get a question that's out of their zone of expertise, they can pick up the phone. Think, look at what we're doing right now. They're talking yeah. to Dr. Reed Tuxon the dean of the School of Public Health. So this is a place where they can get those answers and we can use the information and feed it back into those shops uh, through our uh, YouTube channel and other ways in which we can bring this information, uh, Michelle, right into the shops. And I love that the what they're now saying, here's what we're hearing in our chair. Mm -hmm. They're bringing those questions right to this forum. Uh, Katrina has her hand up again. She must have another one. You got another one? No, you done, Dr. T? No, I just wanted to say something to Andre in regards to when we we're sharing health information. I just want to tell him one of the things I always tell the clients that come through my salon is I'm not a medical professional. I just share health information right. in, the, right. in the way that I can deliver it to you. And if you have any other questions, if you need me to, that's when I would kind of advocate for you. And we can sit down and we can do some research and try to get some understanding. But I always remind them that I'm not the medical professional so that they can't come back to me and say, you said this. Well, well that's what I'm uh, saying. I'm playing. That's just that. another way to, you know, to deliver it to your clients. Just remind yeah. them. You're no, 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 no. <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm playing devil's advocate. So there, there's perhaps a question that someone didn't ask mm -hmm. that, that I tried to put out here tonight. Okay. So it's not, yeah, it's not. I'm definitely not a doctor. I'm just saying that perhaps somebody that has a question that wasn't asked. Mm -hmm. and as as a devil's advocate, uh, hopefully I covered something that someone else didn't. Yeah, okay. Absolutely right. did. Absolutely. All right. All right. Let's let's do okay. this. Uh, we 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 do need to uh, kind of find out what's happening with the public health minute. Well, let's do that, and then we're going to bring up some more. No, hold up, hold up. Before we go to.
Mike up a minute. Let's go to Thank Mike. Uh, let's go to Mike Brown because I saw his name uh, first, and then we're going to go to you, Meg, for public health minute. Bring bring Mike Brown up, and uh, hey guys, again, didn't do. Hey, hey Donna, Mike. Hey Mike. How, hey, how you doing, man? How's everybody? So this is uh, for uh, Doctor Lucy Um I think uh, humility is definitely the way to uh, get across the information that we're trying to by coming to the public because. My community may not be com Katrina's community, or it may not be <laughs> Michelle's community, or it may not be your community. But dealing in my community, uh, you have questions or you have statements like, Mike, my grandma was vaccinated. She caught COVID and she died. Uh, why am I getting vaccinated? Uh, why should I get vaccinated? The information you're saying, I mean, I'm dealing with some tough cookies out there. and. Um, when it lands on their doorstep and it didn't land in their favor, you know, they always come back and they point at us. So um, I wanted to point out that humility, the way you come and look, we don't know all the answers, mm -hmm. but uh, we are still trying the best to deliver the conversation to you in the best way, manner, in, in the best possible way. However, you have someone saying, but you're a barber, so are you giving me propaganda? It's just that type of community I'm dealing with as far mm -hmm. as uh, the people that I see on the day to day, their, their, their outlook on this whole pandemic thing is something different. And it's like they'd rather have nothing and just die with nothing than to try to fight with something. And uh, it's a very frustrating uh, part for me to be in to try to, I have the truth, I feel like, it's feel like I'm uh, going into Egypt to try to free the people. And <laughs> and the, the yeah. people are like, who are you? you, you you're, you're nobody. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you keep fighting in, in, in this fight that we're in and giving the information. But um, I don't want to keep rambling on. But I just wanted to say thank you for that because uh, humility well, is the key. Michael, yeah, Michael, I think that's a really key feature. And, and, and I think, you know, as the, the, the pandemic progressed, you know, even in the early stages, I think we lack that in the world of science, in the world of public health, right? We want it to be the answer of people and be right from the beginning. And what we turned out to be then was being viewed as liars because nobody was right at the beginning. I mean, do you remember there was a phase where everybody was saying, don't put on masks. Oh my God, save the masks for the doctors and the nurses and the, the therapists working in the hospitals. We don't have enough. Well, in retrospect, that was a bad thing to do. And I think the humility we need to have is to admit the fact that we made mistakes in the midst of all this. But don't forget, science isn't stable. It, it, it's not like it's set and these are the rules given us by a person coming off the mountain holding the tablets of science, right? That's not how it is. Science changes. It can never be written in concrete. And, and the humility is the fact is that that people like Dr. Andresik and, and Dr. Tuxen and, and others, right, in the world of science are out there always trying to figure out what is the right answer. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes we're wrong, but we're never wrong maliciously, right? Nobody's out there to do evil. Mm -hmm. At the end, we also want to make it very apparent. I mean, right now, even though there still could be a lot of vaccine hesitancy out there, we know that vaccines work. And we, when we have that in front of us, right, we have to be bold and we have to be able to support each other in that, right? But you're right. You're absolutely right. I think there's got to be humility and there has to be a sense is when we're wrong, let's admit, let's not yeah. hide behind a curtain and saying, ignore that man behind the curtain. You know, it's the Wizard of Oz scenario. We're I not think, wizards here, right? I we're just trying I to help people. I definitely think that approach lowers the guards of the people that we're trying to get the message across to. I just yeah. wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thanks, Great Donna, job, Mike. Uh, Mike, Donna, Mike Brown. All right, <laughs> let's, let's bring up uh, um, uh, Meg Jordan for the Public Health Minute, because we really want to kind of understand where we are uh, and uh, get a get a kind of a snapshot of of how we, this, uh, this COVID thing is evolving. Go ahead, Meg, the Public Health Minute, Meg Jordan. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to um, run you through the numbers. So as of, since the beginning of the pandemic, 92.7 million people in the United States, well, 
92.7 million cases of COVID have been reported. 1,037,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the U.S. And 223 million have, Americans have been initially vaccinated and 108 million have gotten their first booster dose. Next, please, Maggie. So I wanted to show community spread. As we've been talking about, the numbers do look better this week. Um, but I want to remind everybody we're still about 30% of the country in a high spread zone, which means that you should be wearing masks everywhere you go, including places in Maryland. Um, next, please. This map is where we are in terms of vaccination coverage. So the darker the blue, the more people in total. This is everyone in the US. Um, so the darker the color, the more people who've been vaccinated um, at that 70 plus rate. So we still have large portions of the country which are at a very low rate of vaccination. Next please, Maggie. I wanna talk you through again, how to build a household plan for COVID-19. So as people are emerging more and as kids are going back to school and people are starting to go back to work, think about six things for your household. One, vaccinate and boost all members in the household that are eligible. Two, knowing how to ventilate your home or your workspace, whether that's through windows or whether that's through an air filter. Three, talking to your doctor to understand whether you can get COVID-19 medications if you get sick, um, antiretrovirals, or if you can get some kind of um, like Paxlovid, they call it PrEP mm -hmm. um, for lots of different things. Four, have rapid tests or know where you can get a PCR test locally and have them ready as soon as you feel ill or when you get exposed and you wait that five days to go test. Five, Make a plan to keep high risk people in your house safe. And part of that plan is knowing whether you are high risk. And then six, have well-fitting high quality masks already in your home, ready to use in case someone in your house is sick. So this is the public health minute for this week. Thanks so much, Meg. And it's it's very important to, to deal with the practical so and what we're talking about is this is what you literally can do. So so when you know you owe, right? So <laughs> so, so so you know, do something to uh to protect yourself. We're gonna do a few things. One is let's let's go on and see if we can get uh the the uh uh pulse on what's happening. Let's do the word cloud quickly as we uh do a round robin with uh with our stylists and our Barbers, uh, that's uh, behind the scene. And, as well. and you know, it's a, it's amazing how time flies at eight fifteen. Mm -hmm. But you you know the drill. Uh, in that chat, and those of you in social media on the Facebook and the feeds, just use the question box. Drop the word in that best reflects how you're feeling at this moment in the pandemic. And for the next sixty seconds, we'll just drop as many words as possible, one at a time. And uh, those of you looking, if you see words that resonate with you. Um, Put that in, the larger the word when we see the cloud, that means the more people who felt that way. And the team behind the scenes are gonna build the cloud and they'll let us know uh, when that's ready. But I'm listening to this conversation, Mayor, mm -hmm. and I'm realizing once again that our, our, uh, uh, our barbers and stylists are like on the front lines and they're hearing things in the chair from their clients that we can um, program around, uh, that we can design for. Mm -hmm. And uh, this issue of anxiety, uh, while the example was a child, a 10 year old, uh, um, maybe even uh, the dean uh, knows something about, even among our college students who are experiencing the anxiety of this moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do to help make that okay, both to acknowledge it, as well as things that we can do to help reduce the anxiety. Uh, well, Dean, what, what did you think about that conversation, Boris? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of it is, is again, how do you reduce anxiety? You reduce anxiety to some extent by being honest with people, 
right? And then as uh, Dr. Andresik has, has mentioned already, is making sure that we care for them appropriately, right? There's no magic formula to the reduction of anxiety in the midst of a crisis like this, right? Part of it is give people the facts, let them make decisions, but mentor them in that decision-making. So I think that, that's a real key feature in all this. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's, let's bring up uh, 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 Dr. Sharon Cooper, uh, and then I want to bring up um, uh, Sandra Jenkins. So bring them up both at the same time uh, so I can uh, uh, get a get a pulse on, on what they are, what they're thinking. You know, um, um, doc, Dr. Cooper, we we we're at this point where many people don't know what to do or what to believe. Um, people are going into family gatherings where no one has a mask on. You walk into the family gathering with a mask on and people are looking at you like a cow looking at a choo-choo train. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you know, what's wrong I mean, with you? you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, you know, walking past you like, like, hold up. No, you see no one in here has a mask on and you're going to walk in. It's like an insult. We all family, man. We, we ain't, let, let me let me go let me go to the, we ain't got no COVID, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, man. So so you know you you leave that for what you when you around your bougie friends, right? But 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 we all good here. How how do you how do you work with people on that, Doctor Cooper? Well, you continue to use it as a, a teachable moment, and that, that's why forums such as the, these are so instrumental in teaching people. Um, I, too, have been diagnosed with COVID in my whole entire household as well, and I was one of those individuals who was um, uh, prescribed Paxlovid. Um, so, but with that, my provider had told me we've had an uptick, not as many hospitalizations. However, there are more and more people being exposed, more and more people uh, being diagnosed. And the other component of that is like um, the dean had mentioned, under reporting. And the less data that we have, the more the people feel more complacent and relaxed that this is not something to be concerned about. So again, it's all about, yeah, I'm the odd person out. I went recently um, three weeks ago or so to University of Houston College of Medicine and they had their white coat ceremony. And we, my family, we were basically the minorities with the mask on. Um, but, you know, on another note, it's initiatives like this and people like Mike, Andre, Sandra, Katrina, um, and all the other stylists that are helping to um, um, helping medical schools to understand the importance of treating people with respect and dignity and addressing the needs of disparities in communities that are marginalized and communities mm -hmm. of color. And they made the point to present that, their director presented that. And the link that I had with the University of Houston, I'm gonna make it real quickly, Dr. Mm -hmm. Casey Williams. And her sister-in-law made the key speaker and she's one of the directors there. And her emphasis was on reducing disparities, getting that connection within the community. And that's a result of initiatives like this that mm -hmm. help to advance knowledge, understanding and literacy. Last note, Dean, Congratulations on your reappointment. I met you years ago. Give some you more snaps. Let's get a dean some snaps. We glad, you were we glad he's back in the house. And getting me recommitted to community service. And most and foremost, you introduced me to Dr. Uh, Stephen Thomas, who's my mentor. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the thank audience you, out there, that white coat ceremonies is what happens in medical schools. My step so you're around all these medical people with no mask, mm -hmm. but you sent a message to them. Wow, that's you powerful. sure did. Absolutely. And that's way across. And Dr. Williams said in one of our forums here. And so through that connection and through my step grandson going through, you know, being admitted to the school, that's how I was able <laughs> to make that connection. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. wonderful. So thank you all for all that you do. And I wish you continued success. Thank you. Thank you're making you. a Thanks difference. So Thank you so much, Dr. Thank, thank you. She's been with us the whole time as well. Just a dedicated person. Uh, so, so glad to, to have her part of the team. Um, uh, Sandra Jenkins, all the way in the 
Philly area. I know she's right outside of Philadelphia, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but she, she's uh, one of our Starwood uh, supporters as well, and a part of uh, the Cutting Edge team as well. Um, Ms. Jenkins, what what's your thoughts about what's happening? Because now you know we got we got to make sense. There are people still dying mm -hmm. from COVID, right? People are still contracting COVID, and there are people who are under vaccinated. I I don't think we've talked about it enough. Is that we have uh, a significant number of people who have not been fully boosted, who are eligible mm -hmm. to be boosted. And that means that there is a level of vulnerability that they have that they may or may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. So we got to continue to 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 preach, you know, the message that vaccines help vaccines uh, save lives. And we got to continue. We cannot get weary in well doing. What's your thoughts about that? Uh, my thoughts about it is keep pressing, keep pressing on in um, the salon. I decided to start keeping a track of our own data, our own data of those individuals that have called and informed us that they've been tested with COVID. And we've gotten three clients who have called last week. So what, where do we go from here? What we do, we educate and we inform our staff. We mainly get that receptionist and make sure she's steadfast at that desk and she's doing temperature check. She's doing mask donning. She's doing sanitizing. And all of those things is a part of her description. So anybody that walks in, whether or not they're coming in to get a service provided, or they may be folks that are in the neighborhood that likes to drop in and give a little hello, and they think they can stick their head in without a mask on. <laughs> you know, they know when they walk in there, Oh, I'm just standing here at the door because they know what, okay? They they know what, what the requirements are in there. So I'm saying that keeping, you know, account of the data, uh, all those clients that I am so dependent on in the next couple of weeks that will not be coming and getting their services. But I am very grateful the fact that they felt confident enough to share that information in order to keep all of us safe. So the importance I, I I feel with working right in our own little, like, like in our environment is making sure, number one, we follow those protocols as Trina and Mike stated and and, and Andre and, <laughs> and, and build on that. You know, if we have to make sure that, you know, our clients are safe, if we give them a call, we feel as though that, you know, we haven't heard from them, you know, how are you doing? And sharing that information with them that, you know, um, you, you, you can, you can, um, you can feel confident and let us know. It is not a secret to all of us that you have COVID-19. You, you know, Mayor, I, I just want uh, Dr. Andresic and the Dean to mm -hmm. pick up on that little piece. What did Sandra say? I'm collecting data. We didn't charge her to do that. This is, now she's in that readiness mode for mm -hmm. capturing what's, and they feel comfortable calling mm -hmm. you and telling you. That's another very important piece. Mm -hmm. So that says it's a trusted environment. And I love that mm -hmm. you're collecting that data and we're gonna help you do a, even a better job systematically in collecting that data. Thank you. What, what you're doing is you're setting a standard, you're perfecting a service. Mm -hmm. and that's, uh, that's what this is all about. All right, let's uh, see what's happening with the uh, word cloud because we are like a minute away. Can you believe that? I can't believe this. Well, okay, well, here we go. It. Oh my uh, goodness! You know, you know, you know. You see, <laughs> you know, people are are. are I, I see tired there, but you see determined and blessed uh, mm -hmm. are even larger. They're driven, hopeful, uh, thankful, grateful, inspired, uh, early. Uh, informed, challenged, giving, movement, tolerance, on, honored, uh, left out, optimistic, uh, and uh, fort front running and forward and humble, innovative, and uh, all go. of the words. But but you know, blessed uh, by the best is what I see. <laughs> uh, the rest. <laughs> And, you know, <laughs> Mayor, I love that innovation part. And while, while we're getting close to closing out, I want the uh, the team to pull up the Barbershop Storybook cover. 
because the issue of anxiety in children came up. And I wanted Dr. Andrasik to know that we listened to Mike, Katrina, and all the wellness warriors, and they said, you know, you got to break it down. You're making us epidemiologists, microbiologists. And we brought in some artists, and we have a series of barbershop storybooks. These are the stories that the barbers and stylists are telling us turned into a zine. And the first book deals with the anxiety uh, of, of, of practicing the COVID mitigation. And we bring in a counselor and we're making these things normative and destigmatizing them. And I wanted you to see this direction and, and, and wanted you to know you're part of the direction that we're heading in. And we wanna make sure that all this information is scientifically accurate and, and sound and yet reaches people where they are. Well, that's, that's an absolutely wonderful way. We talked about thinking out of the box all the time, but uh, <laughs> what we do is we don't even have a box here, Dean. We threw the box <laughs> away. <laughs> we, all right, bring that down. We, 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 we threw the box away. Uh, let's, let's, let's thank uh, our wonderful guest uh, in, in his absence, uh, Dr. Reed Tuxin. Awesome. awesome. Uh, our Dean. Uh, who thank is, you, Dean. Uh, our dean. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Boris uh, Lusniak, uh, thank you so much, Dean, for what you do, man. You are you're an incredible person. Uh, you always uh, uh, just warm my heart. Uh, uh, Dr. Andrzejczyk, it, it's always good to see you. It's good to, you know, you need to <laughs> hang out with us more, you know, get, come and come in. You are welcome anytime, right? Okay, I will. It, I will. Yeah. It's great to see all of you. Absolutely. <laughs> this is such Wonderful. an amazing program. Absolutely. We need more of this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And, and and last but certainly not least, uh, to to come up and hang out with us on the on the platform, uh, and we're going to do uh, more of our, our wellness warriors are going to come up and we're going to highlight them. But this night today, uh, it is uh, uh, Katrina Randolph who came on and and uh, did your thing and dropped the mic and. You know, she's, she's just an incredible person. So we're so, we're proud of you. Thank you so much for what you do, both seen and unseen, right? Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, we, yeah. do, we do appreciate you. Uh, to, to, to Mike and Andre and, and Sandra and, 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 and Sharon, uh, Sharon uh, and everybody that, that, that's behind the scene, uh, thank you all so much for what you do. Dr. T, Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your support. Uh, and uh, let's let's keep this thing going. Uh, again, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, uh, show. What we're trying to do is, is get clarity and get understanding because it's more important. You can get knowledge, you can get all of that, but it's more important to get understanding. Mm -hmm. And truth and liberation is the same thing. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Oh, Thank you for the truth uh, today uh, to the Dean and all. And as always, I like to leave you with these two words. Remember that I love you with a perfect love, but more importantly, remember this, remember this, you got the power. Thank you for joining with us on this <laughs> segment of The Cutting Edge, and we'll see you in a few weeks uh, okay. on this powerful show. You take care of yourself because you owe it to yourself. I Bye -bye. just wanted to say one thing real quick. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for letting the wellness warriors participate in this. Uh, so I'm saying this for Mike, Katrina, and everybody. Thank you very much, guys. We love you. you. Love you too. Take care. <laughs>